مقاومين وكانهم منفلتين عن القانون Coming up on Jerusalem Dateline, shades of 1938 with a pogrom in action in Amsterdam. Israel sends two rescue planes to Holland for the injured and any wanting to escape. Plus, exploring the possibilities of an Israel at peace. How could a post-war Israel be governed? And uncommon bravery. How the volunteers of the United Hatzalah rushed into danger on October 7th. All this and more coming up on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. Israelis in the Netherlands were urged to seek shelter in Amsterdam after a brutal assault by a mob of armed Muslims. The attack followed a soccer match where at least five people were hospitalized and 62 were arrested. Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl has the story. Israeli soccer fans in Amsterdam to watch a game were violently attacked and threatened by a giant mob of Muslim immigrants armed with knives and clubs as they left the event. The Israeli government is sending flights to rescue Israelis who are said to be hiding in their hotels after the brutal attacks. Israeli media and social media exploded with coverage and outrage about the attacks, which are being called a pogrom, an organized massacre of an ethnic group like the Nazis carried out against the Jews in the 1930s. Thursday's attack happened just days before the 86th anniversary of Kristallnacht, when the Nazis launched multiple pogroms against Jews. Prime Minister Netanyahu says he views with utmost gravity the planned anti-Semitic attack against Israeli citizens and requested that security be increased for the Dutch Jewish community. He spoke with the Dutch Prime Minister, who posted on X, calling the attack completely unacceptable anti-Semitic attacks on Israelis. Some media reports say there were signs of tension even before the attack. The Times of Israel reports video on social media showed Israelis chanting against Arabs and Palestinians in the city, apparently before the violence, and that pro-Palestinian anti-Israeli activists claimed the Israeli fans were the first to harass and engage in violence. Newly appointed Foreign Minister Gidon Saar is traveling to the Netherlands to handle the crisis. Deputy Foreign Minister Sharon Haskell says many are hospitalized. I call on the Dutch government to arrest and prosecute all those involved. And we have information from social media leading to those radical Islamists who went hunting for Jews. She challenged Europe to take action. I call on Europe and the world to act more aggressively to combat anti-Semitism. This is your responsibility. Israeli Jews being attacked by a violent mob in the heart of Europe is something no one should stand. If we fail to act, it will only get worse. And the National Security Council issued a new warning to Israelis and Jews in the Netherlands to avoid movements in the street and lock yourself in hotel rooms. The externalization of Israeli and Jewish symbols must be avoided. The latest violence has once again focused Israeli fears on the rising tide of international anti-Semitism. Well, I'm joined now in our studio with Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl. 
Julie, what a week. I mean, just Tuesday, people were rejoicing here about the Trump victory. So they were happy. quite excited about it. But in yesterday, such a sobering turn of events there in Amsterdam. Yeah, it really was, you know, and right right before the anniversary of Kristallnacht and, and everything. And, and you had some information that this was that they yeah. they were notified ahead of time. We were in touch uh, this afternoon with the Ministry for Diaspora Affairs and Combating Anti-Semitism, and they actually sent an alert to the Dutch authorities that there was an extreme uh, possibility of violence. They had the groups that were preparing for the violence. This kind of undermines uh, their claim that it was the Israelis who started this. And this says they were planned uh, and they were warning of violence, and that's what they sent to the Dutch authorities. And by all accounts, it seems like they didn't act on this uh, report. Yeah, you know, and I, I mean, OK, the Israelis are not perfect and maybe they did misbehave. And I'm not justifying that. But, you know, they are coming from a from a country that's fighting an existential war. And then to go there and and see these Palestinian flags. I don't know what happened. I don't know who started what first, but there's no way that this wasn't planned ahead of time. Yeah. We have the stories from the Israelis, you know, that uh, that they were when they came out of the stadium, that there were these large groups of Palestinians at every exit with knives and Palestinian flags. And so, you know, there there was definitely a plan to mm -hmm. do something. Yeah. And, and the testimonies are horrific. Yeah. Uh, somebody was jumping into the canal to escape. Somebody actually played dead for an hour or hours to make sure he was going to be murdered. Uh, you, the video, you can see people were actually run over by this. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and the one, every testimony that I heard he, in Hebrew or English was that there were no police. There were mm -hmm. no police. Now, we did see police in certain areas, but, you know, like you said, the people were like for hours just just trying yeah. to save themselves. What does this do for the Jewish people when they hear the word pogrom, when they see the videos and uh, and does it evoke the the memories of Kristallnacht? over 70 years ago, yeah, 80 years ago. Yeah, I think ago. so. You know, even even in the younger generation, everyone knows about the Holocaust. You know, maybe somebody's grandmother, great-grandmother was, was uh, you know, involved in some way. And, and I think it, it really still strikes a chord in people. And there's, you know, anti-Semitism is spreading. We see it in all different ways yeah. throughout Europe. And, and it's, you know, it, it's real. It's real. Yeah. And I, there's no way that it's not affecting people. There's no way, you know, people, the Israelis, they keep trying to go forward, but yeah. it, it's really intense for them. Yeah. And just a reminder, the Crystal Knock is called the Night of the Broken Glass. Back in 1938, literally hundreds of synagogues were burned or destroyed. Over 7,000 businesses destroyed by Jewish owners. Uh, a sobering reminder. Yeah. Thanks, Julie. Thank you. Coming up, looking at possibilities, visionaries at the Middle East Summit brainstorm about Israel's future. More than one year after October 7th and in the middle of an ongoing war on multiple fronts, many are looking forward to what could be next after the war. Our next two stories show some of the ideas being put forth. This first one concerns an initiative some believe could create a new reality in the Middle East. Called the Middle East Summit, this movement seeks a new vision for truth-based peace. It's an incredible initiative, I think, to start, even in the middle of a war, start thinking about what the future looks like, start brainstorming about it, thinking of new ideas. I think we need new ideas. We've been stuck in a rut, we're stuck in a war, but we need to be thinking beyond the war. Tonight, we're launching this vision. Uh, and as you've seen, uh, we have your ambassadors and members of Knesset and ministers and many influencers from the world and from Israeli society, from the media, from the academia, from all over the, uh, the country. One organizer, Knesset member Ohad Tal, tells CBN News how terror served as a wake-up call. I think that after October 7th, which was the hardest day in Israel history since it was established, I think we woke up and I think now is the time and especially after everything we've seen in the past year in the war, what is happening in, in, in Gaza, in Lebanon, in other places in the world, including what is happening in Iran. I think now is the time to launch a new vision. I think this was uh, 
the beginning of a, hopefully a national conversation within the state of Israel about what Israel will really look like in the aftermath of October 7th. Former U.S. Ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, introduced his vision for a future Middle East in his book, One Jewish State. You know, it changed a lot of things about how Israel perceives itself, about how it defends itself, about its values, and, um, and about what its borders ought to be, and um, whether it can live with the Palestinians uh, in, in, a, in a separate state or not. And I think a lot of conclusions have been drawn from, from that event, but people haven't really had a chance to talk about it, you know, kind of intellectually, what does it mean? And I think this was the first opportunity to really do that. These leaders see the two-state solution created in the Oslo peace process as a 30-year failure, and the Knesset recently voted overwhelmingly to reject it. That's where Friedman's vision could fill the vacuum. I concluded that there could never be a two-state solution, and I wanted to offer up an alternative, which I think is both the best outcome for, uh, for people who care about the Palestinians and the best outcome for people who care about the security of Israel and the best outcome for those who want to fulfill God's will. So I thought I would write something, put it out there, um, and, and make it be part of the discussion. Yeah. Tal and Friedman believe the key to peace is declaring sovereignty over the biblical heartland of Judea and Samaria, known to much of the world as the West Bank. Israel is the solution for the Middle East. If we really want to achieve peace, prosperity and stability, the way to do it is to apply Jewish sovereignty in Judea and Samaria. The whole land, the Holy Land, should be under Jewish uh, uh, sovereignty. There's 30, 40, 50 Muslim states and Christian states and Hindu states and Buddhist states, and there ought to be room, ought to be room in the world for one Jewish state the size of New Jersey on territory as to which the Jewish people have a better claim to title than any people to any, world, any other place in the world. And so why can't there be one Jewish state and how do we make that happen? Friedman points out that's one reason. He asked former CIA director and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo to write the foreword to his book. He said, look, why should we be surprised that fulfilling God's will achieves the best outcome for all the inhabitants of the area? Mm -hmm. And that, that to me really is, is, is the theme. I mean, God gave us a vision. Um, it's not just a theocratic vision. It's a practical vision as well. It's a vision that brings peace, prosperity, human dignity to everyone in the region, all the inhabitants of the region, Christian, Druze, Muslim, Jewish, everybody. And, and, and I try to write a book which presents this really as a win-win for everybody. Tal believes we're living in biblical times. We're seeing in our own eyes the fulfillment of so many prophecies of the Bible. And now is the time for us to be, to join, to be part of the redemption, to, to, to help God push forward history to really make the Jewish people a light up to the nations. Up next, resettling Gaza and turning the page on a two-state solution. Why some Jewish people feel it's time to go back. With the defeat of Hamas in sight, the question is, what happens next? Some Israelis say it's time for Jews to move back into the Gaza Strip. As Paul Stan reports, they believe it's a serious mistake to forcibly remove all Israeli Jews out of Gaza and hand it over to the Palestinians in 2005. It was a deal known as swapping land for peace. Here's his story. Many Jews find it blasphemous to give away any of the promised land that God granted to the Jewish people. But they also point out when it comes to Gaza, swapping this land for peace certainly didn't give Israelis peace. It gave them Hamas, thousands of rockets shot at them, and the massacre of October 7th. During the recent holidays, a group of Jews who are ready to move back to Gaza and help resettle it as part of Israel gathered by Kibbutz Beri, very near the border with Gaza. We have 700 families that are ready to settle Gaza now. This Likud party member believes the Jewish nation will be more secure once large numbers of Israelis re-inhabit what is now just enemy territory. We are here because most of the people of Israel understand that settlement is security above all. Daniela Weiss says the atrocities the Palestinians of Gaza committed on October 7th forfeited their right to have the Gaza Strip as theirs alone. Until the 7th of October, there were still people, people who believed that there is a chance for maybe for peaceful life between Gaza and the state of Israel. 
no more. The massacre changed history. These people and their allies don't believe in only moving Jews back into Gaza. They want to see many of the Palestinians now there move out. Encourage emigration. The truth is that this is the most moral, the most correct solution. After all the damage and suffering Hamas has caused, Weiss believes it's a kindness to help Gaza's Palestinians settle elsewhere. They deserve be, being released from the hell that Hamas imposed on, on them. And so her group is investing money, encouraging and helping the Gazans to go. Tell them, we give you the option, go from here to other countries. The land of Israel is ours. Paul Strand, CBN News, Jerusalem. Still ahead, taking no thought for their own safety on October 7th, the volunteers of United Hatzalah. The events of October 7th revealed a lot about Israel and Israelis. It revealed who the heroes were. Many of them were among the volunteer emergency aid workers. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl brings us the story of one key organization. They're called Angels in Orange, United Hatzalah volunteers who aim to arrive and provide medical aid within 90 seconds in an emergency situation. The name means United Rescue, and volunteers jump into action the minute they're needed. That's exactly what happened on that fateful day more than a year ago. October 7th was supposed to be a very special day for me and my family. It was supposed to be my son's bar mitzvah. And we were, you know, the whole family together by my parents, all excited. Allah Akbar! But at 6.29 a.m., missiles started flying, alarms sounded, and when they didn't stop, Dovi Mizell knew there was trouble. We're getting more calls of missiles over here and shootings over here, and I'm like, I'm talking to my deputy, so he immediately deploys to, to headquarters, and my, I got my whole operational staff all on the way. This is the United Hatzalah headquarters in Jerusalem. I'm sitting on an ambu-cycle. United Hatzalah has more than a thousand of these countrywide. On October 7th, the volunteers that ride them sprang into action to save lives. The United Hatzalah being a community-based emergency response organization bases its whole operations method on the community response. And suddenly we have hundreds of these volunteers from Zderot, Netivot, Ofakim, all responding in their communities to massive incidents of shooting attacks and explosions and grenades and like it literally felt like the apocalypse. This is the control room in Jerusalem where they received the calls for help on October 7th. As more reports of terrorist infiltrations came in, Mizell said they had to quickly decide whether to deploy volunteers and ambulances from other areas to the south. Ground rule of emergency medical services is safety first. Always. You never go into the hot zone, never go into harm's way. You wait until security forces clear the area, secure it, make sure that there's no threat to the volunteers responding. They understood early this would be a very different situation. And I made the hardest decision of my life then and said, we're all going in under fire. We're not going to force anyone. We knew where the parameters of the hot zone is. We have our staging area. You do not have to go in. Some were wounded, like Rabbi Sasi, a volunteer from Sterot, who responded to a missile attack on the police station. Later, he received a special three-wheel ambucycle so he can continue to volunteer. So we told the volunteers within the region there, respond in your neighborhood because you're in it anyway. Obviously, put on your protective gear, your bulletproof vest, your helmet. More than a thousand volunteers took part in the 36-hour mission, saving more than a thousand lives. I have no way to explain it, you know, in a natural way. Having hundreds of people go in under direct fire of terrorists, missiles exploding, grenades, shrapnel. We have dozens of volunteers' cars that were full of bullet holes and ambulances with shrapnel and tires torn and 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 but no one killed. Mizell credits divine protection. 
Thankfully, there were angels came down from the heavens on that day and protected hundreds of volunteers that went in under fire. And we have endless footage here of battles with terrorists, and yet none of them were killed. Mizell says Israeli nonprofits and volunteer groups really came together to save lives then, and they're now preparing for other battles. Knowing the threat, not even only the North, but they call it the fire ring of Iran and its proxies. We understand that if we won't prepare ourselves, we'll never be ready. They've stocked up on motorcycles, emergency vehicles, and other equipment such as generators, backup, and satellite communications. We want to think how we can utilize and leverage this power of community, of the amazing volunteerism spirit of Israeli society. And it resonates with the name of our organization, United Hatzalah. Hatzalah means rescue. What are we uniting? The cross-section of Israeli society, men, women, Jews, Arabs, Orthodox, secular, all in this one mission of saving lives in the community. Mizell believes Jews, Christians, and Muslims are able to unite in these challenging times because those who volunteer to save lives are a different breed. I always say our mission is saving lives, but our byproduct of this organization is, is building bridges in the community here. And it gives a lot of hope, actually, especially in times like these. Mizell thinks this is the toughest year Israel as a state has ever had. And probably it's going to get worse before it gets better. But there is a strong sense of optimism because being around as a nation for thousands of years, we're not really worried about the short term. We need to live it out. We need to uh, add more light in doing good and we'll, we'll prevail here. <laughs> Julie Stahl, CBN News, United Hatzalah Headquarters, Jerusalem. Julie, such an inspiring story. On October 7th, it was so chaotic. People had to make decisions, life and death decisions. Yeah. And at the risk of their own lives, they went right into the fire. Yeah, they did. You know, there were stories of, of men, you know, a long ways away, an hour or two away, just jumping in their cars and driving down there because they were soldiers mm -hmm. and they wanted to help save their country. Yeah. So there, there's a lot of that here. You know, Israelis, on, on a regular day, they might argue with each other and everything. But if there's a need, they really do do jump in and, uh, you know, and pull together and, and to save lives, even when it's not their job. That's what they did. It's such a great story. And, you know, I've done a story on United Hutzela uh, a number of years ago on riding on an ambucycle and they every day they're out there saving lives. Yeah, they really are. Yeah. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on social media and you can access CBN content through our CBN News and other CBN apps. And please keep praying for Israel. Your prayers mean so much right now. Keep praying for the peace of Jerusalem, for the safety of our IDF soldiers and all those in harm's way, and for the hostages still captive in Gaza. May the Lord bring them home soon. And remember, the God who watches over Israel and you and me neither slumbers nor sleeps. I'm Chris Mitchell. And I'm Julie Stahl. For all of us here in Jerusalem, we'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.